Posso começar? Olha, boa tarde a todos. Um prazer enorme. Good afternoon to everyone. It's a big pleasure to be here together. And I would like even to invite you to come closer. Please sit closer to us with, so that you can listen and enjoy of this great opportunity that would be the discussion over our team on, on social vulnerability. The, the, our, with our, our good friend of the London School of Hygiene and Med Tropical Medicine of London. She, has a, she does a very do a great work, very enthusiastic. It's not only for in Europe, but also in Africa. But we also got to know that she's doing a work, a very challenging work here in Rio de Janeiro. In Rio de Janeiro. She's actually working now in Rio de Janeiro, bringing a new model of, of, uh, of an essay of uh, applications for, for, the, for, the ch for the children, survivors of the Zika virus with a, a line in a field of research, very, very, very good, very nice. At this moment, when we are looking for, we are looking forward to see this discussion to the study of disability studies that that uh, gives us the perspective of understanding of the person, of the disabled person in the society, in all the multidimensionalities that this that there's all, all these factors uh, that society, people and societies and culture, roles of model of uh, living, we have to discuss this very seriously because, because uh, this very, because we need, we need to need all this kind of information and we have to build a level of level of presence inside society that privileges the human diversity so i would like to thank professor hana and we are very happy to welcome here and professor saldiva who was good enough to house us as the Institute of Advanced Studies of the University of Sao Paulo. And I'd also like to thank Professor Segurato, who was the first person who brought me news about Professor Hanna. And the study visit, an exchange visit in London, where he already knew her and the efforts of the department that she directs and in the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine as well. And he brought us this communication. And since then, we have initiated a constant contact and Vinicius remembers this. And I think that it was a very close contact in the best of our efforts disabilities and also the changes that society has to go through and it's a great happiness to us and professor Saldiva I would also like to thank you for your stimulation, stimulated, uh, stimulating presence here and for your energy in housing and hosting this new Disability Studies program inside the Institute of Advanced Studies of the University of São Paulo. And this is our group who is also very enthusiastic about these matters. And I thank you for the opportunity, and I'm also sure that together we're going to build a new way for this theme. And this is not a theme that really that is related to only the disabled people, but for, but the society as a whole. And what began three hours ago is materialized now with Professor Hanna. It's a great pleasure for us to have you here. And please, say, Professor Segurato is 
Strake now, and then Professor Segurato as well. Good morning, Professor Cooper, Professor Battistella, and Professor Saldiva. Good morning, everyone who are attending this session. I'd like to welcome Professor Cooper. In the name of our director, Professor Costa Jr., and in the name of the Commission of International Affairs of this school, as Professor Linamara said, the partnership of the School of Medicine of the University of Sao Paulo with the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine is very old, and it dates back from years ago, and it's been renewed on a constant basis with recent initiatives. And in truth, a couple of years ago, our school signed a memorandum of understanding with H, with the School of Medicine to renew and to exchange initiatives and partnerships in collaborative researches with this prestigious institution, which is affiliated to the University of London. And as a consequence, in 2012, we held a symposium involving UK and Brazil, which took a number of researchers from Brazil to the United Kingdom to improve their relationships with that school of medicine. And then we they were given the Brazilian they were given the opportunity to present research projects and research strains which were of public and common interest with the British researchers researchers and a professor at the School of London invited our team to present their projects so that they could have more partnership with the London School of Medicine. And at this seminar, I had the opportunity to know Professor Cooper, and I have already identified the opportunity to link her to the research strain that was developed by Professor Linamara with a great potential of, of with a great potential of uh, exchange of students and professors and also for collaborative researchers. Welcoming her today in our school is a sign that is international internationalization way supported by our directors are in the right path and this strengthens the relationship between our school and fellow schools from overseas. And it's also a satisfaction for us to understand and know better Professor Cooper's work dynamics and understanding that she embraced this vulnerability issue related to disabled people and human incapacity. And this theoretical reference is very dear to me. We who work in HIV AIDS infection, we adopted the same reference, which had been designed by, John, by Mr. Jonathan in the beginning of the spread of the HIV and AIDS. And that, had that, that, been, that has been spread through other branches. And it tries to be comprehensive and investigate the many dimensions of this vulnerability a biological dimension, a social dimension as well, and maybe a programmatic dimension. Those spots where we as health professionals or and or public health managers are omitting ourselves from offering the population public policies that can meet their needs. And understanding that Professor Cooper embraces this theoretical issue and inserts disability within this theoretical reference is also a reason of great satisfaction to us. And I would like to hear her with great pleasure and know more about her work and know where we could also develop and improve ourselves in this work. Congratulations for the work and welcome to Brazil and thank you for being here. Good, good morning everyone, good afternoon. It's a pleasure for me to be here. I'd like to greet my fellow colleagues here on the table, on the panel. 
as I have a double a double occupation, like the professor of the School of Medicine and a, an IEA director, I think that the people will feel richer after this event. The problem about handling people with disabilities with some of some sort is not simple. It demands situations which are very complex that go beyond the classical box of health. Public equipment, mobility, support networks, meeting spaces, innovative solutions for those people to enjoy the benefits of living in a city. This goes beyond, much beyond than a sectorial policy. And as this matter falls into a multidisciplinarity area, it imposes a number of issues to be addressed because there is so much being said in terms of support and actions which are multidisciplinary or which involve complex systems which are theoretically valued by knowledge, but in contrary, when you are trying to obtain resources, they wouldn't have the same valuation. Because there is a culture in terms of scientific financing or even in, in the pol pol political actions that punctual actions could be or should be addressed. When you can have the new or the whole, but not going in deep in depth of it, but due to a view that the life program is much complicated. But the richness in this is when we have this merger of knowledge, and this merger has to be different. It, we cannot put in the same box different parts of knowledge if they don't talk to each other, unless it becomes something different apart from having all those elements summed. And this multidisciplinarity is not a condition that is sufficient. It's not sufficient. You have to have this merger and you have un to understand this knowledge which goes beyond the production of knowledge itself. Some days ago I saw a conference by a researcher from the Bielefeld Advanced Studies to Honneberg. And he addressed how you handle with the problems of people of, with disabilities. What is the reason for us to be here and what happens to our lives? And the first ideas were put in the same package, in the spiritual problem package. Like Pandora opened the box and did not let anything go out except for hope. And then, as time went by, as knowledge went by, we should understand our problems based on reason, and then philosophy was created, and all natural sciences were also created, and Descartes said, no, I'm going to do this via knowledge again. So, with time, this land, human knowledge to be divided into three areas, three artificial areas with mutual prejudices, like a natural scientist doesn't believe that human sciences are sciences because it's part of a presumption or an assumption, even though a natural science would also have its own assumptions, or even waiving any kind of moral or spiritual value, could not uh, could also apply to the natural sciences because natural sciences should also have principles. You can 
You could, for instance, a mass destruction weapon would involve moral issues as well. And developing one of this kind would also involve, or therefore, ethical dilemmas. And in every case, you should also you should also find a reason for that specific reason. And when Descartes did not kill God, he just changed the address of God. And when a cherub shows up in any Sunday show with a white apron, and if this and if that apron comes from a very prestigious institution, that is a very important archangel. And he'll manifest, uh, manifest himself through a, a, to, via such a hermet hermetic syntax as in the God spell. You change acetylation and the expression of DNA, and nobody understands anything, but everyone would like to resolve this issue. So understanding people with some, some kind of disability involves the analysis of the spirit and the soul of that person, and also the best technique. And it's very difficult nowadays to put all those three elements on the same table and come up with a very respectful dialogue or unbiased dialogue as well. The only thing that we cannot have about this is having an incapable soul, like developing public policies and not having any kind of sympathy t towards people with disabilities. We have to put ourselves in the shoes of other people, feeling the same thing. And putting oneself on the on the shoes of someone who has disabilities. And this is something that's missing, especially in the health area during the education. As I'm talking about spirit, this promotes a phenomenon called astral, uh, astral travel called sleep, where the spirit goes to something, to somewhere which is happier. And what's the challenge of such a network? First of all, we have to produce the best science possible in public and publish this where it could be published, where we could have a, a visibility and reliability. We have to translate that knowledge as well, because as Professor de Lamar said, this approach involving people with disabilities involve a change in society as well. And you cannot change cultures within a short span of time. We have to develop a very convincing narrative which spreads through a long time. And also we have to discuss ethical aspects, aspects related to the fundamental rights of people so that we could define what's going to be done so in order for people to overcome their disability and eventually litigate in good faith. Because there are situations where legitimate interests will be opposed to other interests. Which is the bigger group? What, which is the group which is in most need? And science, just like policy, cannot give up principles. So this is a challenge. It's not easy, but it's better to die uh, of infarct than of boredom. That's why Professor Linamara chose the first option. And everyone who works in, the, in this area know that it's not easy, but nevertheless, they became they became bored about the, the, the task. And I think that IEA could be an incubator which 
during this international collaboration could create a specific institution with the aim of producing knowledge, solutions and public policies which are permanent long-term policies or actions and would not be subject to the bias of changing governments because the the because the step the step is not is not a short track way it's a marathon and as i don't have my wife here i i usually don't i'm not aware that i have to stop and i'm very very touched that we can do this now and having this event take uh, taken place at the school of medicine so that we can address a subject which is by definition multidisciplinary i thank you Uh, my name is Hannah Cooper, and I've come here from London today. And I'm lucky enough to be spending one month in Brazil, and I'm having a wonderful time. And this has been my fourth trip here this year, because I'm working very much on Zika, which I will explain later. So today I'm going to talk about global disability, and I'm going to talk to introduce global disability a bit to the audience, but also the work that we do in our center, which is the International Center for Evidence in Disability. And I am doing this for the selfish reason that I want people to come to me and interact, to collaborate, so that I can come here again. So that I hope very much to foster links with your institution and the exciting work that you are doing, because I think together we will be stronger. And so please, I encourage anyone to contact me and the website for our center is there. So please be in touch. I am an epidemiologist, so I'm very interested in defining things. And I've been working in disability for about seven years. And before that, I worked in cancer and blindness for about 15 years. So I'm going to start with a photo and a story. So do you know who this small girl is? It's me. <laughs> so I was trying to find a picture of myself with my mother because later in her life my mother developed dementia and she became a person with a disability and that had a very big impact on our family and in our setup and how we interacted. And when I was looking for a photo, this was the first photo that I found. And in the photo is also my grandmother. And my grandmother later in life had difficulty walking, she had difficulty hearing and seeing and with understanding, but she would never have considered herself to be a person with a disability, but she was. But the other person was this uh, other lady who was the reason why we were visiting. It was in Italy. And her husband was a rugby player. I don't think you have rugby in Brazil. You have rugby in Argentina. Um, do you know what happens to rugby players? So they have lots of head injuries. So what happens? I think there are lots of medical students. So he developed Parkinson's later in life. So she was the carer for this man with Parkinson. So I found this picture and I realized that everybody in the picture was very much touched by disability. And I think that is not unusual. I think that's because actually we are all touched by disability when we think in our personal lives. And maybe we think that the person is old or the person has a specific disease like Alzheimer's, but actually it's often disability and it has a big impact on all of us. But because I'm an epidemiologist, I'm uh, obsessed with definitions. So before we start talking more about disability, we need to talk about what is disability. And we could talk about this for months, for years, we could argue, but I'm just going to present very quickly the first few ways of thinking about it. So one of the traditional ways of thinking about disability has been as a charity model. There is this person and there is something wrong with him. 
and I feel sorry for him and I'm going to try and help him and that makes me feel good. And that's not a very empowering way for this person to be seen because it is not seeing that this person with a disability is equal to everybody else and has rights. So this is something that is not a very common portrayal of disability. Now I understand that many people in the audience are doctors and medical students. And so another common way of seeing um, disability is through a medical model. So there is this child and this child has something wrong with her. So do we know what it is? So she has a club foot and therefore has a disability and I can fix this child and cure that child and then that child will no longer have a disability. And medicine is a wonderful thing and it is fantastic that many people can be treated or cured or prevented from having disabilities, but it is not the whole story. And there are many people who have disabilities that cannot be cured by medicine and that we need to have a way of thinking about them as well. And that there are influences on people's lives, people with disabilities, not just their health, but other things as well. So for instance, this is the social model of thinking about disability. So the difference between somebody who is a wheelchair user being able to work in the one building versus the other is not to do with the fact that he or she is a wheelchair user. It's to do with the fact that one of the buildings is accessible and the other one is not. So if we think about disability, um, and, and this is a very common way of seeing disability in the UK. So it's pushed hard that disability is a social phenomenon. It's about the social environment. It's not about the person's body. But I'm not sure that I always agree because I think uh, medicine is very important and that uh, it is not just down to society alone. So let's say if somebody is in pain all the time, they are in pain all the time and that's going to influence the kind of life they lead no matter how many ramps there are in place. So putting all of those together, so if we think about the social model versus the medical model, and the one, the medical model the, would be this person has a vision of 660, the impairment, and the social model would see it as this person cannot walk alone. So it's just different ways of seeing it. And the standard way now is to put it all together. Is there a pointer? Okay, so this is a very complex model, I'm sorry. So the idea is that somebody has a health condition. So that health condition could be diabetes, it could be Alzheimer's, it could be Zika virus. It could be all the things that we in this room study. And because of that health condition, that person may have, ab aha, thank you. So the person has a health condition and because of the health condition he may or she may experience difficulties in body function and structure. They may be finding it difficult to see, to hear, to speak, to move. And so this is something that the health and the medical side focuses on very much. What are the diseases and what are the impairments? Okay and that a lot of the treatment is focused on these two areas. So can I treat diabetes? Um, can I improve physical functioning? But people who have difficulties in phys physical functioning may then not be able to perform activities like walking, and that stops participation, so having a job, or being involved in society in some way. So as an example, let's say somebody has polio as the health condition and so has a weakened leg and can't walk and therefore doesn't have a job. And this is very important because people will not talk so much in terms of their function, you know, how many meters they can walk. They will talk more about the social impact. I cannot walk al alone outside of the house or I cannot see well enough to recognize my friends. So it's very important to look at the social side as well. And so one of the reasons why people in this room may be interested in disability is because many of the health conditions you work with can be disabling. So diabetes, 
um, leprosy, mosquito-borne diseases, Zika here is obviously one, road traffic accidents. So that disability can be one part of the spectrum of other diseases that you are looking at. Now this flow from having a disease to having a disability is not inevitable. And different people will have different experiences. So let's imagine this person who is a wheelchair user because of polio and therefore cannot have a certain kind of job. So, sorry, let's say you give the person a wheelchair and then you haven't affected the polio, the functional difficulties, the ability to walk, but you've enabled people to be more independent and therefore have a job. So this is assistive devices. Or you can provide retraining or training in specific skills so that people are able to have a job. And so this is very important because from a medical perspective, we focus very much what can we do here in terms of treating the disease and what can we do here in terms of treating the impairment. But this model helps us think more broadly about what we can do to strengthen environmental factors and personal factors to allow people to have the best possible lives. So I'm not saying that one is more important than another, it's just that we look at this whole picture. So thinking a little bit about that model, that disability is about both the body and the medical aspects and the society can help us think in a more nuanced way about who we think is disabled or not. So let's say this is a child with club foot and maybe that child is able to walk and maybe that child is able to play football and run with their friends, but maybe that child may find it difficult to get a girlfriend because of the way his feet look. So it's not just about the function, it's also about stigma and um, society around that. Or for instance, this person. So this person has got six toes on each foot. So it is not, um, you may not think it is something that would have a very big impact on your life. Now I had a colleague from Canada who's an orthopedic surgeon and he was going to go to Rwanda on a mission, and he wanted to do very complicated cases. He wanted to go in and fix children and do the very complex things. And he was brought a whole lot of women who had six toes, extra digits. And he said to the healthcare workers, why have you brought me these women? This is not uh, important. I want to do these really difficult things. And he said the healthcare worker said to him, if these women have six toes, they will not be able to get married. So he said, okay. So it's again this disconnect between the physical impairment and the impact on somebody's life and that we need to think broadly when we think about disability. Or albinism is another situation where albinism, people with albinism, particularly in Africa, can experience a lot of stigma and violence and actually fear for lives because of beliefs around people with albinism. And then on the other side, you have somebody like Stephen Hawking, who is a professor of physics in the UK. And he has, um, Lou Gehr he has motor neuron disease. And so he has severe difficulties. He has difficulties communicating, walking, self-care, all of these things he finds very difficult. Cognitively is fine. But because of his assistive devices and because he's got money and is educated, he is able to function and to, have, to participate at a much higher level than somebody with his body in another setting. And so when we're thinking about disability, we have to think not just about the body, but also about the environment. But I come back to, I'm an epidemiologist, so I'm obsessed with counting and with definitions. So putting all of this together, we can start thinking about how many people are disabled. Now the definition of disability is horrible. It's very complex. So it says people with disability include those who have long-term physical, mental, intellectual or sensory impairments, so people who are physically impaired, blind, deaf and so on, which in interaction with barriers may hinder their full and effective participation in society on an equal basis with others. So that is a definition that is very compatible with the model that I showed you, 
but it is very difficult to use to go out and count and classify people as you are disabled and you are not disabled. And it's very controversial how you measure disability and there are lots of different ways of thinking about it. But about seven years ago, the WHO and the World Bank put together a report which collected all of the available data and they estimated that there are about one billion people with disabilities in the world. So that's about 15% of people or one in seven people. So disability is incredibly common. And that of those one billion, obviously disability is a range and some people will have lots of difficulties and some people will not have so many difficulties. But it's estimated that about 110 to 190 million experience very significant difficulties. So that is about four or five times the number of people with HIV. It's a very big group of people. So another reason why people in this room may be interested in disability, not just because it is a part of the pathway of other conditions that you're investigating, but also because it's very, very common. So one of the things we are very interested in in our group at the London School of Hygiene is how we measure disability. And I won't bore you with all the details because it's very technical. But we're thinking about different ways. So we're helping to develop mobile tools. So there are now mobile tools um, to measure hearing. Uh, there's this mobile tools to measure vision and to take retinal photos, which are just amazing. It was developed by somebody in our group and how to measure visual acuity. And we're trying to develop new ways um, of measuring disability in general and the different impairments, and also looking at physical impairment, which is very complicated because it's such a big spectrum. So this is one of the areas where we're very busy and also to see how we can measure disability in children more effectively because that's quite a different issue to measuring things in adults. <laughs> So about a year ago, we, um, just as an example, we did a national survey of disability in Guatemala, which I'm just showing because it's the closest country that we've been working into Brazil. And we screened about 14,000 people and about 10% of people were disabled. But more significantly, that was one third of households. So disability is very much experienced at the level of households and one third of households in Guatemala included a person with a disability. So I don't know what that means for Brazil and there there's hopefully will be national surveys soon, but this is what we found in Guatemala. So disability is very common, it's often 10% of the population, 15% of the population, something like that. And then the question is, how is it distributed? Who's most likely to be disabled? One thing that is very clear is that disability increases strongly with age. So this graph shows um, disability in aging, any disability and then severe disability. And about 70, 80% of people with disabilities are above the age of 50. So it's very rapidly increasing with age and um, it's quite rare in childhood. And that's because disability is related to lots of conditions, so it's a natural part of aging, or in old age many people lose vision and hearing, but also lots of NCDs will impact on people later in life. And in your context, where there's a growing burden of NCDs, you may begin to see a lot of disability arising from things like stroke and diabetes. So just again for Guatemala, what we found here again was that disability increased strongly with age. So in the older adults, it was almost a quarter. So I think that was people over 60. And it was a little bit more common in women than in men. And that's usually because women live longer than men. And I'm showing you this pattern because this is what you see everywhere in the world. So what we found in Guatemala, what we find in all of our surveys is disability is a bit more common in women. It's much more common in older people, and it's related to poverty. So within countries, it's more common in households that are poor, and it's more common in low-income countries. And that's because of vulnerability and because of lack of access to healthcare. And if we think about the type, the reasons why people have disabilities, the underlying type, 
So again, this is looking at Guatemala, but I'm showing it because it's fairly typical. About a third was because of mental <coughs> cognitive conditions. So a lot of it was anxiety and depression, and then also dementias. And about a third was physical impairments. And then the others were things like seeing, hearing, and other conditions like with communication. So again and again, we see that physical impairments are more common than visual or hearing impairments, and that uh, mental disorders are very common causes of disability. So turning now to what does this mean? Why does it matter? Why does it matter that there are so many people with disabilities? And it matters because there's a very big impact of disability in people's lives. So we did one study with Plan International. Plan International is one of these children's sponsorship programs. They have a million children who are being sponsored. And each year they collect information about those children to send a letter to the family who sponsors them about what their child is up to. So it means that they collect data every year on a million children across 30 countries. And one of the questions they ask is basically, does the child have a disability? But they ask lots of other things, health care, education, and so on. So this allowed us to look across those 30 countries about whether the children with disabilities had different kinds of lives, the children without disabilities. And I'll just give you a couple of examples. So in terms of education, the girls, this is just giving Indonesia as an example, the girls with dis without disabilities, 95% went to school. The girls with disabilities, it was only 48%. So the odds ratio was 21. So they had 20 times higher odds of not going to school the children with disabilities, the girls with disabilities. And with the boys, it was an odds of 10. But I said that there was data across the 30 countries. So this graph shows the 30 countries along the bottom and the odds ratio is up the side. And this blue line is an odds ratio of one. So anything above the line shows that the condition is more common in children with disabilities and anything below the line shows that it is less common in children with disabilities. And this is for girls. And here's this data point for Indonesia. So the girls were 21 times more likely not to go to school if they had disabilities. And if we look across the countries, consistently the children were five to 10 times less likely to go to school. And that's true in girls. And Brazil is here, 25 times. And it was also true in boys. So here's Brazil, 15 times less likely to go to school. Yeah. And it's very well known. So children with disabilities are often excluded from schools. And when they were asked why they didn't go to school, the reason why most commonly they said was because of their disability. That was why they didn't go to school. When they did go to school, they were at a lower level to the children of their same age. And this varied a lot by impairment type. So the children with intellectual impairments were least likely to go to school. And this is something that we find again and again and again. So the children with disabilities are not going to school. If we look at health, we found the same thing. So this is serious illness. So in Indonesia, the girls were more than four times more likely to report a serious illness, this is the boys, than the children without disabilities. And again, we found that across all of the countries, for boys and also for girls. So a couple of common patterns we see is that people with disabilities are excluded from school. They're much more likely to experience ill health. They're also much less likely to be employed. And when they are employed, they are employed in they um, more um, poorer paid jobs and more vulnerable jobs, you know, shift working and so on. And because of all of these things, there is a relationship between disability and poverty. And it could be that people who are disabled become poorer or that people who are poor are more likely to become disabled, and it's probably both. And here again, there's very strong evidence. So we have just done a systematic review in low middle income countries. We found 169 studies. We had to screen 10,000 titles. This was a lot of work. I will never do it again. 
and 136 showed a positive significant association between disability and poverty. So this is something that we know. There is a very strong relationship between disability and poverty. And then if we look more broadly, all these different aspects of life we see in impact. So people with disabilities find it more difficult to access appropriate water and sanitation. Um, people with disabilities are much more vulnerable to violence, and that's something that I've heard that you are working on here as well. They're more vulnerable to malnutrition, and so these are all different areas, I'm just showing you some reports, different areas that we have worked on and that we are interested in, where it'd be wonderful to collaborate and look in this country too. And cutting across it, people with disabilities experience often large levels of stigma and discrimination, which cuts across these different areas of impact. So the third reason why we might be interested in working on disabilities is because of this wide impact on school, labor market, social exclusion, barriers, health, poverty, and that this affects the family of, as a whole. Going back to in Guatemala, a third of families included somebody with a disability. And the reason why I'm here really for a month is because of Zika, thinking about this impact. So I've been involved in various different projects looking at Zika, and most of them are very holistic, and I'm a little part in them. So they're looking at how the mosquito affects humans, how there's sexual transmission, how the, the different symptoms of Zika, the different symptoms of the baby, what happens to the cognitive development and so on of the baby. But there has been very little focus on what should be done for those babies and what the impact is of having a baby with congenital Zika syndrome in the family. And so this is um, one of the projects that I'm working on. So we were working um, to look at what does it mean to families and communities that so many babies have been born with congenital Zika syndrome. Um, and we've kind of been thinking about it like a, a ripple. So this stone lands, that is that the baby is born. And that baby with congenital Zika syndrome, it, the syndrome has a big impact on the baby, and that baby has a big impact on the family, and it has an impact on the community, and so on. And we're trying to look at all of these waves, looking at the impact on family, on pregnant women and decision, and how they feel, on the community and decisions about reproductive health and fertility, and what health professionals are experiencing, and the impact that this epidemic has had in their professional lives, and how they interact with patients. And we're looking very broadly at the impact, at the economic impact, the social impact, the needs of the child, the mental health effects on the mother, and so on. Um, and this is just through working with two groups, one in Rio and in Recife, and it's mixed method looking at qualitative and quantitative. I'll just skip over that. And one of the things that's very clear is that these babies have very high healthcare needs. So in the interviews, one mother said, we go to the pediatrician and those specialists, the neurologist, the speech therapist, the physiotherapist. I leave home at 7.30 to be there for 9.30. There is only one bus here that goes there and it takes a while to get there. That's why I leave early. So these babies have very large healthcare needs and they are very fortunate that here in Brazil those needs are being met, that the children with congenital Zika syndrome are able to access these specialists, but it is creating a big burden for the family, a big time constraint. But looking beyond Zika and beyond these babies to people with disabilities in all communities, you know that they have very large health and rehabilitation needs. Now, because many of us are healthcare professionals in this room, there are two reasons why we might need to think about this. The one is to think about the kinds of rehabilitation services that people with disabilities need, and I know that there are many groups here working on that. But the second is that people with disabilities need the same health care as everybody else also, whether it's contraception or vaccination or flu treatment, and they may find it very difficult to access those services or to have the same quality of experience if the hospitals are not well set up to, to, for them to go or if there's a lack of um, sign language training or, or whatever it is. 
And so it's interesting to think how we can best set up healthcare services to meet these needs because they find it very difficult to access services. So we've been thinking quite a lot about rehabilitation and about how rehabilitation is um, provided in low and min middle income settings. And uh, I know the group that has invited me is working very much in that area too. One thing that is clear is that the evidence base is very poor. We need to publish a lot more. We need to show our findings. We need to show good practice a lot more. And the WHO is very interested in scaling up rehabilitation services and having more physios and more occupational therapists and so on. But it is also my feeling that we maybe need to think in a different way about how we provide rehabilitation. We may need to think more creatively and about different kinds of modes of um, delivering the service. And so we have been working a little bit in this area. So um, this is a colleague of mine from India. He is an occupational therapist. And what he found was that in his hospital in India, which was a very good hospital, people who had had mild or moderate strokes were being released home. And they didn't have much access to rehabilitation and the family wasn't given much information about how they needed to care for that person because there were very long waiting lists and so on. So he developed a mobile phone app and he recorded different exercises, different ways of preparing for daily living, how to dress, how to brush teeth, how to feed and so on and made it freely available to patients so that they could see the exercises and be reminded again of what they should do. And he said that all of them, in his test case of 50 patients, all of them used it every day. So there was a real need for it, and he's now scaling up to do a trial to see whether in the absence of a large rehabilitation workforce can mobile technology help support people in their lives. And I think this is really exciting, um, technical solutions. The other thing we've been thinking about is parent support and training carers. So often families are the people responsible for looking after people with disabilities, but they often haven't been given much training in that. And when we were given this grant to look at the impact of Zika, we said, okay, we're very happy and thank you, but um, it's very difficult for us to go and explore the impacts without having something to offer in return. And so we were given funding to develop support groups for parents of children with congenital Zika syndrome. And that's what we're working on um, in Rio and in Salvador. So this came from a previous project. So in about 2013, we did a big study on childhood disability in Pakistan and Bangladesh. And in both um, countries, we identified about three or 4,000 children with disabilities in the community. And we ethically, we referred everybody for services. But the biggest group was cerebral palsy. And there were no services for these children with cerebral palsy. So we said, okay, we will develop something. And we developed this program of parent support. So we brought together groups of 10 parents with their children and they met periodically once a month or once a week. And they were given training in different aspects of care. So some of it was very practical, how to carry the child, how to sit the child, how to position the child, how to feed the child, because malnutrition was a huge issue. And some of it was about social and psychological support for the parents and what their rights were and how they can access their rights. And this program, um, we've now used in lots of different countries. It's been downloaded something like 3,000 times. And we've shown that it helps to improve the quality of life of the parents. It's very difficult to show an impact on the functioning of the child, but we've shown that it helps the parents. And so our plan is to adapt this program for the children with congenital Zika syndrome, because the two conditions are very similar. In adapting it, we need to think about more early stimulation, because these children are younger the ones with congenital Zika syndrome, they're being identified younger than the children with cerebral palsy. There are some specific healthcare needs in Zika that we're not seeing in cerebral palsy. 
So for instance, lots of issues with vision and seeing, lots of problems about epilepsy, so mothers report daily seizures, problems about irritability of the child and screaming of the child. So some, some features are different to Zika, so need to be added, and we need to strengthen the component of psychosocial support. And we've been in the process of doing that now, that adaptation and translation. And uh, next week, we're going to start training people in giving this intervention. So in both Salvador and in Rio, we're training four physiotherapists, but also four expert mothers. So it is the mother, we've selected some mothers of babies with congenital Zika syndrome who are going to help lead these programs to help tailor it really to the needs of these mothers and what they need to do. And so that's going to run over the next six months or so um, and hopefully uh, maybe a helpful addition. So this is another different way of doing rehabilitation. So one is kind of mobile phones, the other area is through parent support or carer support. In this kind of program, you could think about training the carers of people with Alzheimer's or post-stroke or people who are blind. There are all sorts of ways in which we can strengthen the skills of carers. We're thinking quite a lot about how to increase uptake of care. So often people are referred for rehabilitation and don't go, and what are the kinds of barriers people face, and, but more interestingly, how can we overcome those barriers? We're trying to show the effectiveness of rehabilitation or different um, treatments. So we did a study on cataract, which was in the Philippines, Kenya, and Bangladesh, where we identified people who were blind from cataract, we interviewed them about poverty, quality of life, and activities. We offered them cataract surgery, and then we went back one year later to see how people's lives had changed. So this is the same man before and after, and his smile has become bigger. Mm -hmm. um, and we could show that this was a very cost-effective intervention, which means we can find more resources for it. And we're now working on doing something similar in Myanmar with prostheses. And we've just done a study in Guatemala on hearing aids. So what is the, do hearing aids improve people's lives? And we found that yes, they do. That things like depressive symptoms going down after you give people hearing aids. And that can help for advocating for more services. And we're, I'm very interested, and I've been talking today with colleagues here about universal health coverage and how we consider people with disabilities as we move towards universal health coverage. And that I know Brazil is one of the champions of achieving universal health coverage. And what we find is that disability finds the gaps in the health system. That we have an image of a perfect health system and how everything slots together. But when it comes to people with disabilities, we can find the gaps. So for instance, with these babies with uh, congenital Zika syndrome, we're revealing lots of gaps that locally there are very few services to support them and that they need to travel far and that there are lots of complexities in that. And so we're trying to think more holistically about how can you strengthen health systems to also meet the needs of people with disabilities and will that actually make the health system better for everybody if you try and improve the, the links between the primary level and the rehabilitation level downstream and how you make those sustainable. How you can, rather than putting rehabilitation in different bits in the uh, health system, how you can make that integrated as part of it so that it becomes sustainable. So I suppose what we medical professionals often focus on is this bit and this bit. And what I've been talking a bit about is how can we strengthen environmental and personal factors but I've been talking mostly around health, and that's because I work in a school of public health. But we can have the same conversation about improving access to education, to employment, to rights, and so on. So we're looking at one piece of the puzzle, but the puzzle is much bigger. And one of the things that has really had a big boost for the disability movement, why we may also be interested in disability, is um, lots of international conventions. 
So about 10 years ago, there was the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, which most countries, including Brazil, have signed up to, which protects the rights of people with disabilities. Um, but also very significantly, the Sustainable Development Goals, which were agreed almost two years ago now, include, I think, 11 mentions of disability. So it's now thinking about how we include people with disabilities is going to be forced on us more and more. And I go back to this picture. So this is a picture of people very close to me who were affected by disability. But I would say that this is not the reason why I decided to work in disability. The reason why I've been interested and excited about working in disability, because I could say the same thing about cancer, about stroke, all sorts of things. But the reason why I've been interested in working in disability is because there's such big data gaps. And so as a researcher, I found that really inspiring and really motivating because I can see that there is lots of area for impact for our group. And so um, we've been trying to work where there is very little data and to try and improve our knowledge both about disability but also about how you can improve the lives of people with disabilities. So as a research geek, that's the thing that I found the most exciting in this area. So I want to end there and say thank you so much for your time and attention. Thank you all for coming and for inviting me. Um, and I think we're going to have a discussion now. And please do be in touch. Well, we have time for questions. For questions, if somebody would like to have any questions, please, because this is an incredible opportunity. Clear, we have, we already have two questions. Junior. I have two questions. The first one is that during your presentation, Professor Hanna, I was kept tapping myself how would be the 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 question the matter of the gender and and defi and deficiency but you answered us with data saying that 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 the challenges are high challenges when in the, the perspective of the care of the rehabilitation of the community uh, of this very near view. So when you go deeper in the matter of genre, you see that this challenge is bigger and very, very complex. And maybe because of the rapid, uh, as you showed Guatemala and Indonesia, Indonesia and Brazil, the percentual is very, uh, it's very close and the challenges of the difficult that the girls with with uh, in a bit disabilities. So maybe Brazil and Indonesia could, could be very close. Uh, I saw the chart very quickly, but I would like you to compare uh, this this subject on this perspective of gender, what we did the challenge of Brazil concerning this disability towards girls. And the second matter would be the matter of sustainability. How is it that and at the moment uh, uh, we have, of course, you can be in all places all the time. How will this be sustained? Either uh, with the knowledge of the family, but, but how will these families can influence this community so they not, not only the professionals will be involved, but the community in itself can help in this process to, to diminish of the exclusion to, of this genre and relation. So, so, Dr. Inamara, so this is uh, Ambassador and this, uh, this challenge of gender, how, how will we build public policies more transversal because when we cut the vulnerability, we will forget that if, it, if, it, if, it, if it's a girl with disability, it's different of being a boy. Uh, and if she, if, if she lives in the street, and if, if she doesn't have this coverage, coverage, uh, if this is even more challenging. So I think that this is the challenges that poses to us. How can we, how can we do this? My name is Andrea. I am a teacher and I work with inclusion. 
regarding these bias of the medicine, regarding what is the teacher doing here, and I think that we cannot just live for education, but I have to have other biases to bring this disabled child to the school. I'm going to defend here pedagogy, and I think that school, if it's not the first part, it's the second part of that jigsaw. We are working on physical, on physical disabilities, and I think about two things. The first one is the, this welcoming. How can we welcome children with disability? We're not talking about sustainability. We're not talking about the family and the people, and we have also compassion involved, and also that of the professionals who could dedicate a time during the week to talk to the family about how the school is going, and inclusive school is valuing this. And on the other hand, on the other hand, we should have also specialized people and school could also have an important role for this first jigsaw, which I think that teachers have to be included in. And school should be aware of this all. And if, according to the graphic, this, the child belongs to cycle one and the elementary school is the one which is mo who is most probable to become, to develop this deficiency or disability, we should do everything from from the very beginning, involving the social part, the physical part, special, the Brazilian sign language as well could also be present at all schools, because if the adult loses hearing at 50 years, for instance, and if he, he this adult had already been taught in Brazilian sign language, then he could have access to school, and that's what I advocate because that's another way of addressing this, and it's part of the daily life of anyone who has any kind of disability. I will try to answer. So, the question of gender is very variable between countries, and so I would defer to my colleague to talk more about what those differences might be in Brazil, because I'm new here, I'm an outsider, I'm a visitor. But certainly, um, you see greater challenges for, for girls potentially with disabilities, or different challenges. So we see high vulnerability to sexual violence, especially girls who are deaf. We're doing a project at the moment about menstrual hygiene management among girls with disabilities. When we started, I thought this is a very small issue or it's an issue for, it's a big issue for a small number of people. But actually it's really important um, because what we're seeing in our data is lots of girls with disability having forced sterilization or forced contraception because of difficulties of family managing menstruation. So there are different kinds of issues that may affect girls versus boys with disabilities. Um, so there is this kind of um, multi-dimensionality to gender and disability in general. But I, again, I'm only an epidemiologist. I'm more of a numbers person. So I'm not always best to explore those things. Um, I'll just touch on the sustainability. So what we have found with sustainability of services, so in, in African settings, let's say, a lot of the rehabilitation or the specialist services like ophthalmology are given by NGOs. So it's not by the local health service. So the NGO will say, I'm going to start a cataract service, I'm going to start this or that. And when the cataract, when the NGO pulls away the money, the service goes. But the more integrated that service is within the healthcare system, the more likely it is to be sustained and remain, which sounds obvious because it shows that there's a, a need and a buy-in. But here you have, in Brazil, you have a very different setup because you have your own health system, which is not so donor-dependent. 
And so then it depends on how you can influence the prioritization. Most countries, and I'm sure Brazil is the same, have very good policies about disability, that they'll have very good anti-discrimination policies. But what you often see is a big discrepancy between those policies and then the actual implementation. Um, and I think that is where the gap is. And so as you mentioned, people with disabilities and their organizations and communities advocating is one important step. I think from the research perspective, we have to be able to demonstrate solutions and things that can be done feasibly and cheaply to allow inclusion. Um, and just touching on um, the, the teacher, I think education is very important, obviously, in that um, we need the perspective of the children with disabilities who are excluded as well as the teachers about how that inclusion can best be achieved. I think we have to remember that it is a right of those children to be included in education. It is not a generosity to include those children. But that actually, many of these things are interconnected. So in studies that we have done, one of the main reasons why children with disabilities don't go to school is because they're unwell. And so you also need to address the healthcare needs to allow children to go to school. So it's lots of different sectors working together. I'm sure others have much to add. <laughs> no. Um, um, we all have to think about how the different life cycles work and the needs that all of us have throughout this process. And when I think and I wonder about disability in our current world, I don't see reasons why we should not give ch uh, children with, with uh, disability with proper education, and that should meet the specific needs of that child, or that would also apply to youngsters who are seeking jobs. And the great issue about public policy is how to build space to ensure access of that vulnerable population to those services. When you talk about that, school is the first piece of that puzzle. You are very right about it, because without this very first step of welcoming people with disabilities, and providing them with good development and good performance in terms of their own capacity, we would, you would not be, or they would not be encouraged to overcome other barriers. If a person with disabilities faces so many obstacles, then this person would eventually give up. And that does not apply only to people with disabilities or in vulnerable situations. That would, it would be great if we had a, such a fantastic country where we could only waste time or apply our time in thinking just one thing, like uh, culture and so. The challenge of a transverse, transversal policy with people with disability is involves per allowing that policies from many areas could converge and although it's a distant target that is possible sometimes what measure what is missing is the measure that we lack sometimes we don't measure disability and I think that we should not measure it this way we should measure the processes that lead to the results like the indicators that lead to good results but we don't measure the success of our public policies with other people and this lack of perception about what works and what does not and what takes to good works sometimes that limits the good results of everyone and this public which is the public that we represent people with disabilities eventually miss a public policy with consistency, with actual possibilities of meeting, meeting the aims, the targets, and the challenge of, of this issue nowadays is not even policy, nor the result that it can bring. It's the conscious or awareness of each one of us. 
about building ways which actually address everyone's rights. The perception of all human rights has to be clear inside us. But in the simplest things, like the other people's right to have access to public, to quality public transportation, and that applies also to more complex like uh, issues like a fully adapted school or access to culture. And th that's the perception that we understand in the disability studies as part of the culture of each society regarding the articulation of so many areas which eventually generate a change in the structure of society itself or the country. And that is the greatest aim involving people with disabilities. And it's interesting that this disability issue is not something that relates only to the person with disability. It involves the entire society. It involves the family, st uh, social, structural changes. It involves also a view, a moder uh, modern view over things. It involves a new cycle that allows that new technologies make that functionality expresses uh, or translates into other possibilities with the same aim, which is building a full and fair society. So understanding disabilities leads us to a, an opportunity to rethink about the social model of this world. And it's up to us to build the changes that will effectively perform and consolidate our commitment with a society with less inequities. But especially I like when Professor talks about, Saldiva talks about compassion. We usually talk about empathy and rights, but compassion is an older term and perhaps a more strengthened terms in this welcoming or pair welcoming process. That represents that when I have the dimension that I need to support one's journey because we are on the same path, then you build a more fair world. I recall a moment when Professor Saudiv, or sorry, a, a professor from this school was talking about his activities as a rower. He had to row with uh, the same path, sorry, the same pace. And even though people had had a shorter energy as him, they could get further. And together we will go faster and further. I have to try to put everything in the same package like this gender difficulty and the role of schools. Yesterday I talked to the Secretary of Education and they had a partnership with an education development group and they proposed solutions which did not work because they came from Finland or somewhere else with very distinctive characteristics, but in IED, we have a group to address this as well. And we are establishing partnerships with the government to promote these joint actions in order to assess what actually works in Sao Paulo. First of all, what is a good school? There is not a single school. It's what defines a good school? Uh, like a good school is, is uh, searching for the causes that made the school good. And then we could identify a list of uh, good experiences so that we can promote an uh, intervention. I liked the example of India, for instance, where we have the idea of uh, assessing what actually works in India, for instance. Maybe one of the activities that we could do here is establish an observatorium and identify, identify experiences in our country that worked. 
and which should have regional characteristics. And also, we should be aware of what we can import and perform these intervention studies. What I liked about your presentation was the following. The work does not is not over after it's published at The Lancet or in the World Report. Okay, it's good. You, your ego is boosted. You can even generate electricity from it. But what I feel is, in research projects from these multidisciplinary teams, you have to propose solutions, identify solutions, and what leads to the idea that a science has to have principles when you work with people who have speci special needs in the best of the world the product comes to a proposed solution and s we saw an example of this today an example of a, a research project that has as, the, as its aim this and including financing agencies are uh, willing to to finance these policies and this is not the case of the public policies in brazil you just ignore what's being done and you don't have accountability in brazil and this is what we're talking about here that is the idea should be identifying what worked where how and trying to identify tailored studies for specific actions. Maybe we should have a framework in having the school with a, an identification role, for instance, or the church. If the person has a no notion as he listens to voices, starts listening to voices, maybe he should look at uh, a church and maybe we could train people to identify these voices. <laughs> A network with screening. So there are many things that we can imagine. And, and I think this conference brought us a very global perspective, very rich. I only feel sorry that the students of the medicine school were not present to listen to your conference because, uh, well, they are, they are doing tests, but uh, they are not learning. So you are ev ev evaluating. Uh, you're evaluating to test, uh, which is a situation, very peculiar situation. But I think that I, I really think that this would be very good to expose the concept, because as seen as as the disability is going to happen to everybody, like you, like we saw in your family, we will also be touched. You see, I'm already touched because if I consider uh, some disturbances cognitive, I'm already part of this group for a long time, but but this also implies in all kind of diseases. If he, if, he, if, he, if, he, if you see coagulation, this is a maybe important phenomenon. So if you have a cancer, you see there the possibility to hear a genetic rearrangement for your maintenance. So everything that killed you, so in this context, the, the illness would be hemophilia and not thrombosis because you lost your adaptive mechanism that made you be alive. So when a doctor understands this, he sees, he sees that he's in the same boat, in the same waters, that, that the person that he's treating, they are all in the same boat, they are all in the same frequency. And this ability also, maybe the ability if we had a time machine, and mine was accelerated because I broke my knee. And I started seeing things that I had never seen before. The, the, the holes in the streets that before I never looked at them and all the difficulties that it is to walk uh, here, in, in, uh, here in our medical center. So I think this would be a very good exercise, Dr. Inamara. I think that we should incorporate the, stu the, the study of disability in the, in the discipline of humanism in, in, the med in medical school and to live with this I think this would be a way 
our making feel exactly. I thank you very much here, because we have here present here uh, people the age of my sons listening to me. And this does not occur at home, of course. So I'm very admired with this experience. That for me is very new because I get, I get home and and I feel myself. Uh, that I feel, and I feel like uh, that, that, uh, that, my, that my children see, don't look at me, that I'm invisible like a ghost. So thank you very much for looking at me here. Professor Aloysio uh, also has a very experience at what goes to prejudice uh, because of population that you are referred. And I would like to listen to this. I would like to make a comment exactly following this line. I liked very much your presentation. Is because th this it matter is how much this concept of the incapacity can uh, can serve to us uh, to uh, to be to the new professional to a doctor, so he can live with the difference. Something is very difficult very lately in order to transmit this to our students because we would like this to establish this kind of dialogue between and the one who is there to take care and the one who's going to be needing these cares a kind of holistic dimension on what we mean this kind of care another matter that i would like to mention is that i would like you to comment this uh, co-living, that is a very rich of investigating the incapacity in different uh, social cultural contexts, that they're from uh, India, from Guatemala, Emanala, to the northeast here of Brazil and Rio de Janeiro. So uh, I would like you to talk to tell us that but more uh, that this what this experience of understanding the disability of as, as a global deficiency disability would enrich. The, the way of acting of each professional in their different context. So I'm going to say something, and I'm not just saying it because I'm here in Brazil, but I think Brazil has been the best place I've seen for how disability is dealt with. And it's not that I secretly say in India that India is the best or in the Philippines that the Philippines is the best. I think I've been very impressed of what's happened in Brazil and that other countries have much to learn. I think that um, today I was shown around a center where there was very good integrated care so that people came and they did not just have physical rehabilitation care, but there was also occupational therapy, there was psychological care, and there was a focus on integration back into the community. And that kind of model of care I see very rarely and is not the case in the UK. So I think that's one area where it's, um, there's much to learn from Brazil. The other area is, um, social, is um, social benefits. That in the, the study that we've been doing with these children affected by congenital Zika syndrome, they've all been getting these social benefits and that that system works very well. And again, that is, I know all of these things can be improved and that when you're inside it, it looks different. But again, that's not true in other places in the world. And I've seen a lot more people with disabilities in the community um, and that the way people have been talking about disability and understanding disability is very sensitive, very nuanced, very accepting that this is, that people with disabilities have rights and that they are part of society. And I think other countries that I've worked on that has not been the case. So that there's not been uh, importance given to rehabilitation, that the rehabilitation has been tokenistic, it's not been holistic, that there's not been a focus on integrating people into the community and meeting needs. So I think that there is a lot, certainly in the UK, that we can learn from Brazil, but definitely in other <coughs> low middle income settings. Um, 
And I think that people have talked very much here about rights and about education, about all the different aspects of life, and that there is this acceptance that things need to be dealt with very holistically. So I'd say the learning is from, I'm learning. <laughs> and I think that there's, we've been talking today about health systems and about the health system that you have in Brazil for providing rehabilitation, particularly in Sao Paulo. And again, that is a very good example of something that works because you're providing rehabilitation at different levels, which is accessible to the community. And again, that's something where we need to learn from elsewhere. And so I think with disability, there's often been a lot of emphasis on looking at problems and looking at barriers and looking at, num at numbers. And I think now we're in a moment where we have to start looking at solutions. And I liked your idea of an observatory. And I think that's, that's fantastic, particularly in a country where there are things that are being done very well so that we can present policy makers and program managers with solutions, not just say children with disabilities are not going to school, but this is how we can get them to school, because that's much more motivating to see change happen. Um, there are a couple of things that you see everywhere with disability, and that's also that I've seen here, um, poverty, stigma, discrimination, but again, here, um, there have been some differences. So what we often find with children with disabilities is the father goes. The father goes off. And we have not seen that with Zika. So the people, um, the physiotherapists and so on, who we've been working with in Rio and in Recife, they've noticed that the fathers are there and that that's different for cerebral palsy, that's different for other things. So again, it's a, what can we learn from that? How can this example teach us how to keep fathers involved and so on? So I'm very solution focused. I'm not clever enough to be a real academic, so I, I like to be more practical. Now we would like to have a coffee break. Oh, we have another question. We have several questions, please. No, we have several que more questions. I would like to have a very objective question so we have more time. So, my name is Edgar. I'm a psychologist. Oh, we have an echo. But I work in the social assistance. I'm a psychologist. And good uh, and part of questions already that I would like to do to make you already commenting. I'm very happy, Professor Honey, when you mention of the benefits of the people with disability because I work exactly with these persons. And one of the few people that work here as a as a watch here in the policy is is the benefit of uh, continuous service for this for people with disabilities. But something that I really thought was interesting on what you mentioned is that the, 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 few, the few number of studies that were published and that would bring us more solutions to the research in some areas. I see that, uh, I hear that here we publish a lot uh, in science and medical science, but in other areas, like in education and public health, public assistance, and our work. And when we involve uh, people with disability, this is very restricted. We have a very small numbers of publishing. Why, do we, why is it that we have such a small amount of scientific production in this area? And how, how, we, how could we make this discussion a bit more popular? Because it looks like in the academia, this is more, consolid, more reasonably consolidated. But how could we make this reach and in the media? How could we reach the population? How could we start? To, to, to release this kind of uh, model of society, the, the, this disability, that, and, and run away a little bit of the medical model. Good afternoon once more. I, I would like to congratulate Professor Anna for your speech and for your work 
My name is Carlos. I work at the ministry. Minister of Work and Disability. Here in our country, as you mentioned before, in our policies, we advanced a lot in the matter of inclusion, although we have to still do a lot. But in the camp of uh, legislation, it's important to remind you that we adopted of the convention, the OUN, as a status of constitutional. But recently, we have approved a Brazilian law of inclusion. There is a very big advance in what refers of the legal rights of the people with disability. However, this matter of inclusion, the work is a challenge that we have to win. We have another law that I consider fundamental that this right to work could be rescued. Is that is the mandatory to make the company that have more or 100 employees, they have to reserve 10% for people with disabilities. Uh, uh, we have still a lot to do because in the last census in 2010 showed that we had like 22.9% of the population with some kind of disability and working in the formal and in the data of to less than 1% according two years ago. But still, we still are going on. But my question is if you are having, if you are developing some kind of research of this, uh, of this person, of uh, related person with disability, with market, the market, the working market, uh, or with work, I think that the market, they have to work. But we are worried about all the risk and how the inadequate conditions of the work can harm the conditioned people with disabilities. Good afternoon, Professor. I'm a psychologist, and I'm very happy to work with Professor Lina Mara at USP, which serve families of children and teenagers who have disappeared. And in 2004, we interviewed those families, and 10% of those disappeared children are children or youngsters with some sort of disability. And I'd like to know if in your studies there is any kind of survey that involves these, involving family and social factors, which could contribute to our knowledge and awareness about this topic. And it's fair if that is a an issue of interest in your studies. My name is Roger. I am a, a person with disabilities. I've already experienced a number of violences. I am graduated, and in addition to it, I've developed a scientific research regarding the symbolic violence against people with disabilities. I'd just like to know if there would be any kind of planning that would extend or foster disabilities in the university universities because from the imagetic perspective i believe that many of the experiences and violences that i've been through were due not because of the disability but everything that i represent everything that my image represents. I am a publicist and I have a, some sort of mental disorder and that's, re, that relates to to a story that relates to Hannah's story as well and I've developed a photographic series and to uh, display it and I'd like to know if from this perspective is there any kind of planning that could extend, would go to other courses like communications to help address the violence issue against people with with disability i think that sh that should also be addressed elsewhere except then in the medicine courses only if that would involve other careers My name is Silvana, and I would like to ask the following question. According to the chart that Hannah showed, there's a, a higher incidence of, of people with disabilities in 
in youngsters and adults. We understand that in Brazil, violence in the traffic and, though, and that due to drugs generate people with disabilities. And thinking that if in her study there is, if there's any any view of this social cost of that specific group, because I think then when we have this and integrated questions to meet the needs of a specific public who is not having disability, who did not have disabilities and eventually be, uh, had disabilities, how is that addressed? Is that done? Is that done via the acceptance of oneself? And we have these different factors. And what other areas would involve developing this policy, which involves actually a a stronger effort and also a differ, different view on people with disabilities, like having those people reinserted in the school, in the work, or in the society. How is that done to that to those people with disabilities? So that's my question. Thank you. My name is Luis, and I work at the Secretary of People with Deficiencies, or Disabilities, sorry. I'd like to, to talk about finding solutions. I'd like to ask you a question and ask a, uh, make a proposal. In your studies, and due to the context that you have with public policies and researches in terms of disabilities, have you found any observatory models that could be benchmarks for us so that we could do something similar in Brazil, which is what interests me the most? So, good afternoon. My name is Regina. I'm from the local teaching service, and I work at the Inclusion Center of Sao Paulo. I'd like to congratulate you for your speech regarding the merger of everyone in the family and in the education areas and in medicine, and because it's very important. And the thing that I'd like to put is that the large number of Zika virus affecting children and and there are people leaving the May, and according to the research done with parents, we have observed that most of them are from families from the northeast who are coming to Sao Paulo for better for a better life. And we are trying to find alternatives and ways of solving those problems, but not problems, but a better way of having uh, these families adapted like an effective inclusion. For people with disabilities and supporting the right to work. And DFID, which is the UK aid organization, is very interested in this. They're very interested in disability, but from an economic perspective and how you can get people to work. And I think it's very important to get people to work from an economics perspective, from an inclusion perspective, from a rights perspective. And if there are fears about the working conditions, then those fears are probably true for everybody. So those working conditions need to be improved for all people, whether they are people with disabilities or not. So maybe we should work more to try and tackle unsafe work environments to protect everybody, including those with disabilities. But there's lots of thinking about how we can work to get people with disabilities into work, into employment. This question of disappeared children is a very is not one that I have heard about before, but I've heard a lot about children with disabilities and violence. 
Now, again, I come back to I'm a quantitative researcher, and questions, very difficult, sensitive questions like these about violence, about abuse, about disappearance, are much better handled qualitatively through conversations and through in-depth. And so I think it's very important to explore, but I'd suggest that that's the way through to get that more information. Um, there was a question about violence, and unfortunately it's really, really common and how to address violence. And we've recently done a study with school children in Uganda. And violence levels against all children there is very high. It was something like 80, 90 percent. So the teachers are often not well trained. They have very big classes. And they control the class through violence. And that the children with disabilities experience, have even more violence perpetrated against them. So the reason why this violence took place was a lot because of the teachers and that structure of the teachers. The teachers weren't properly trained. They didn't know other ways of, tack of dealing with discipline. And so there was an intervention put in place to try and tackle that, and it reduced violence. So I think we need to understand a little bit more about why people with disabilities are vulnerable to violence to be able to come up with solutions. And it will be slightly different in different settings. So for instance, in Nepal we did a study and the deaf girls were very vulnerable. And they were very vulnerable for two reasons. The one is that the school for the deaf was, they, they were sent to school for deaf children and that was away. So they were away from their families and so that made them vulnerable, single girls alone. And the second is that the girls were often not verbal, so they couldn't shout when they were being attacked, which is terrible if you think about it. And so I think understanding a bit more about why these violence happens is very important to try and come up with ways of preventing violence, so that's very important, but also allowing people with disabilities to have access to rights so that there can be conviction of the people who perpetrated the violence. And that's also very difficult. I wasn't quite clear about the question about disability and age. So almost all, this, all the studies show that disability goes up a lot with age, and it's most common in the oldest age groups. And we find that everywhere. So we looked in Rwanda after the genocide, and most of the disability was still in older people, even of physical disabilities. We looked in Haiti after the earthquake, and most of it is still age-related. And just age-related, disability just dominates because of conditions affecting older people. But disability in young people is very visible because we recognize it as being disability, whereas older people we don't necessarily see as having disabilities, and because we worry more about their life with disability. So I'm not sure if I responded properly to your question, but it's much more, even in situations where there's drugs and road traffic accidents and so on, older people will still overwhelm the numbers. Um, of people with disabilities in what we found. I haven't got an example of an observatory model, but what I have got examples of is evaluations. So um, there is lots of different social protection programs around the world which try to address the needs of people with disabilities. And so there has been an international evaluation of eight or nine of these to try and learn lessons across them about what works and what doesn't work. And so that's the kind of model that could be used if you had a, a specific question to see how do we include children with disabilities in school or in healthcare or work, and you can look in different places, but also particularly trying to identify where you think there is good practice that we can learn from, rather than always showing problems and difficulties. Because I think that's what holds us back in the disability movement is not having enough easy solutions. And so it's seen as very difficult and expensive, so we'll worry about other things. Um, and then finding the question about Zika. So we have to be a bit realistic about these children with Zika and what kinds of lives they may have. And they may be very... Um, very intellectually compromised and they are very likely not to go to school in the way that we think about school. And so what we may want to focus on very strongly is also supporting the family to be able to have quality of life while caring for a child with very complex needs. 
Um, so we've come up with one solution, which is to try and train families, and we'd be very happy to share that. And if that was used, that was, would be wonderful. But other groups in Brazil have come up with other kinds of solutions. And actually in two weeks' time in Salvador, there is a solutions fair where different people are presenting the different ways they have of coping with this. So there are, there are lots of examples where you can have an observatory to see what works and what doesn't. Yes. Professor Saudiva, Luizio, do you have any more questions to ask? I'd like to thank you for your presence and your permanence here and that this afternoon be inspiring to you so that we could keep together and build in a good discussion and solutions, as Professor Saldiva said. And I am sure that the observatory could be a tool not only for recording, and but for searching for solutions and for disseminating the best practices throughout Brazil, because the questions involving people with disabilities in Sao Paulo are not those same as in other places in Brazil. And maybe one of our missions now could be assessing what our best indicators are and trying to disseminate those programs with, throughout Brazil. And I'd like to say something, because Claudia Figueroa told about this, which is very sensible, is peop, children with disabilities being kidnapped. And we've already mapped that, we've been mapping that for 10 years, and most families have a hard, a hard time in recording their disappearing because it's not always, it does not always involve a voluntary disappearance. Sometimes an agent co-opts that child and then the child is abandoned somewhere. And this piece of data, we have books and publications about it and also research done with the Minister of Justice, but that impacts us very strongly because as we have many education professionals here, one of the measures which are more effective came from the education segment and it relates to control and prophylaxy because most of the times it's in the school where you feel that the, the ch child is not there and the parent will only discover that the child is not there at the end of the day. And the attention of that school towers the children with uh, uh, from 3 to 14 years of age, that could be the difference between finding or not finding that child alive. We have a history of retrieval of a few children, but between finding the child alive and finding the, the body, we have a huge difference between those ends. And it's very important that Claudia touched that, uh, addressed this issue. And in those welcoming centers, we have an action done with social assistants who have a very interesting control nowadays, and they submit those reports to us on a frequent basis. But schools from the state of Sao Paulo and from the capital of the state, who uh, which have the privilege of welcoming those children who actually have uh, sorry, have disabilities, and these institutions have to have that specific attention and map the life of that of those children on a frequent basis so let's resume our conversation up there and celebrate professor hannes cooper's presence here it's a privilege it's a real privilege privilege to, that starts today and we don't know when it's about to end because it's like we have it here a friendship is forever so thank you, Dr. Cooper. Thank you for sharing the knowledge.